Hello, my fellow Italians, Colco here. October is not only Halloween month, but it is Hitalia month as well. So I thought I would combine the two with some dark Hitalia headcanon since you all seem to like this series a lot. But this time, I let you guys submit your own headcanons. A lot of them were short, so I still had to fill in a lot of the blanks and elaborate. I don't necessarily believe all of these, and of course they aren't canon, again, they're just headcanons that you suggested, and I thought they were cool, so I decided to put them in a video. With that in mind, here are some more dark headcanons for you all to enjoy. Korea is a perfectionist, to an unhealthy degree. South Korea is actually a perfectionist to a rather disturbing extent. He's mostly hard on himself, however and he may sometimes snap suddenly out of nowhere. South Korea has a very strong work and conformist culture. Korean culture puts a high emphasis on conformity and perfection. Parents push their kids to do well in school to the point where they enroll their children in extra classes that last until 10 p.m. Kids who do not conform to the other students in school are often treated as outcasts and are shunned or severely bullied. In the K-pop industry, idols are expected to live up to incredibly high standards. Outside of school, everyone has the same kind of car and dresses similarly, not really wanting to stand out. The nation has incredibly high beauty standards, pushing products like skin whitening cream and eyelid tape on the public. It is known as the number one nation for plastic surgery because altering your appearance to fit these beauty standards is so common there. Getting things like double eyelid surgery is so common, it is expected that young girls are gifted the surgery at a certain age. Things like this happen in other countries in the region, but it is especially prevalent in Korea, especially in the academic fields. Korea places academics so high, many crack under the pressure. Because of these standards, Korea has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. And thus, Hitalia's Korea being a perfectionist would make a lot of sense, especially if it's to an unhealthy degree. America convincing Japan to ban opium. England ran his empire like a drug cartel. He got China addicted to opium, and America, seeing everything that was going on, preemptively told Japan to ban opium when he went to force Japan to open up. In the Meiji era, the Japanese held a negative view of opium and saw it as an uncivilized practice that made people unproductive and lazy. But these views on opium were greatly exacerbated when American diplomats brought their influence over, urging the Japanese to ban opium, claiming that it, quote, injures like the most deadly poison. Thus, Japan strictly prohibited it everywhere it could. America saw what England did to China and wanted to protect Japan, someone he saw as a new friend. So, as American diplomats did, America strongly encouraged Japan to ban opium, to which Japan followed through. America actually cared about Japan and didn't want England to ruin this as he had ruined everything else. Russia's actions towards Poland and Lithuania are because of the Time of Troubles. The Time of Troubles was a period of political turmoil in Russia. I'm going to try to sum this up shortly. Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible as you may know him, may or may not have killed his oldest son, so when he died, they went with his feeble and disabled son, Fyodor I, who also died without an heir, causing a crisis. There was a fake heir of one of his dead sons, Dmitri, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth tried to put him on the throne. During this time, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth invaded Russia, led by the fake Dmitri and joined by the Russians who thought that Dmitri was the real Dmitri and the Russians that were unhappy with the regime. This began a time of confusion and f the fight for the true Tsar. Poland invaded twice and caused political turmoil and anarchy throughout Russia through the backing of this fake Dmitri. Not only was Russia dealing with the end of the Rurik dynasty, but a violent succession crisis with numerous people claiming to be the Tsar, 
a two-year famine that killed a third of the population and being subject to Polish-Lithuanian rule until 1612. That's right. These two invaded Russia and were planning on conquering it. Eventually, the Russians came to a realization that letting these foreigners take over, no matter who they were, was unacceptable. So they organized their own troops, believing that they survived due to their unifying force of orthodoxy, and they had no desire to be converted. Because the Poles were Catholic, and Catholics are gross. So they built up a popular militia and managed to drive out the Poles, and in the end, the Romanov dynasty was established. But Russia didn't just want to survive. He wanted revenge. And thus, crushing Lithuania and Poland during the partitions was extra satisfying to him. This is also why he enjoys putting Lithuania through so much trouble and embarrassment and takes out his frustrations on him. And why he's proud to make a hobby out of partitioning Poland. Every time he humiliates them, it brings him so much satisfaction to someone who almost destroyed everything that he held dear. America being secretly and toxically jealous of Canada. We know that England gives a lot of attention to America and would easily pick him over Canada despite everything Canada has done for him. We also see England giving him a lot more attention than Canada and in general asking for attention more. America said himself that Canada is blessed to have the ability to get along with everyone. Something he has always wanted but definitely struggles with. So he often finds himself trash-talking him when someone compares them or praises Canada. Even though he got more attention, America deeply envied Canada's seemingly perfect personality and behavior. America deeply admires him for who he is, but at a time, he simply wanted to be better than him because he felt inferior compared to him. So as a child, he made sure Canada wasn't given too much attention by England, France, or any of the other nations. He would also find ways to get his brother in trouble or yelled at because he found it funny. And it unintentionally led Canada to be relatively neglected and sometimes even mistreated during his childhood, or at least by England. This also led to a growth that was slower than America's since he wasn't properly being taken care of. America unfortunately kept this habit to cope with his unacknowledged jealousy and repressed admiration. And then, eventually, he came to regret the attention as this attention became increasingly more negative. And deep down, Canada knows his brother doesn't really mean to hurt him, but he still despises America for always having been England's favorite. And because of this, both of them grew important trust issues and a fear of abandonment towards everyone while they were growing up, but mostly each other. The entire time, being constantly unsure of the other brother's reliability or feelings. Belarus's compliance with her boss. It is said the nation's will is second to that of their bosses. However, that does not mean that they agree with them on everything. Most strips show that when nations have a terrible boss that does bad things, they show discontent. However, with Belarus, we see the opposite. Belarus actually praises her notorious boss and even made a fan site for him. This is something that is quite out of place in Italia. How could anyone come to love such an erroneous dictator? Perhaps Belarus acts the way she does due to her people lacking a national identity for most of the history of nationalism. Belarus's national identity is tied very close to Russia's. 60% of the people in Belarus speak Russian over Belarusian. Belarus heavily relies on Russia for the majority of its imports, electricity, business, and oil. The two are even in a union state. This made Belarus skip post-Soviet economic reforms and prevented Belarus from truly forming a national identity. Take a look at another nation who was successful at forming a national identity after the USSR, Lithuania. Lithuania let its nationalists influence its policies after independence. In contrast, Belarus's boss saw national identity and the Belarusian language as an obstacle to Russian integration. Thus, he suppressed nationalists and discouraged the use of Belarusian, promoting English and Russian as a superior language. 
The first thing that the Lithuanian reform movement did after independence was establish a Lithuanian identity and use that identity to distinguish the nation from those around it, highlighting its instances of oppression and portraying the Lithuanian people as innocent sufferers. Belarus lacks this, as they are often categorized as Russians due to the effects of these integration policies and their lack of a distinguished history. As a result, she has become merged with the will of her boss, thus serving as their puppet and becoming more politically minded than publicly minded. However, in recent months, with the recent protests, things might be changing, and an official Belarusian identity may finally be forming. China has a chronic fear of being exploited due to the century of humiliation. The century of humiliation began in the 1840s after the loss of the First Opium War and ended with Mao Zedong's communist takeover. It refers to a string of losses in the 100 years after the First Opium War, including the treaties of Nanking, Wampoa, Aigun, and Shimonoseki, which involved the secession of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea, defeat in the Second Opium War, the sacking of the Old Summer Palace by the British and the French, the Treaty of Peking, which gave Outer Manchuria to Russia, the partial defeat during the Sino-French War, where China lost influence over Vietnam and Southeast Asia, Japan defeating China in the First Sino-Japanese War, the Eight-Nation Alliance invasion to suppress the Boxer Uprising, the British expedition to Tibet, the 21 Demands, the Treaty of Versailles, where the German territory in China was handed to Japan, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, and the Second Sino-Japanese War, which took place during World War II. Due to a hundred years of being exploited and taken advantage of, China has become overly cautious and has developed toxic behaviors as a result. Most importantly, China wanted to redeem himself and show the world that he could be strong. Ever since the early 2000s, China has been set on redeeming themselves in the world and has been set on returning to their former glory as an empire of magnificent power. China finally saw its chance and became an economic powerhouse and was soon rumored to be the world's next superpower. China desires to keep it that way, but has gone through with numerous imperialistic and aggressive foreign policies to maintain that status. China is finally proving to the world that he can be strong, but it comes at the expense of others. Latvia has memory loss from shock therapy. For the last headcanon, I'll do one of my own. As I explained in the first Dark Italia headcanons video, I suggest checking that out. After the collapse of communism, many nations went through something called shock therapy. It was an economic strategy to transition to capitalism, but it could be taken in a literal sense in Italia. Latvia was one of those nations. There is a debate of whether shock therapy worked or not. However, in Italia, we notice that Latvia is especially spacey and forgetful. One of the side effects from ECT, if shock therapy were to be taken literally here, is memory loss and confusion. We often see Latvia confused, but my headcanon is that he has memory loss from the shock therapy. The memories he lost would most likely be memories from when he was self-sufficient, as he has very little confidence in himself when he is independent. I would think Latvia also lost some childhood memories as well as memories from after World War I when he was independent, leaving him feeling helpless, clueless, and feeling the need to rely on Russia. Thus, compared to the other Baltics, Latvia feels that he has fallen behind. And that's all the time I have for today. There were more I wanted to do, but I didn't want this video to be too long, so I might make more in the future. If you want me to continue the series, comment your own dark head canons in the comments below. Please try to be respectful as well. Next time I'm doing a has-been one, so submit your head canons for that series as well. Also stick around for Italia Day because I have a special announcement for that day. But until then, you're probably all sad, so here is my doggo. Look at the doggo. Look at the floof. Forget everything sad that you just heard. Just bask in his majesty. Are you sad? Do not worry. Doggo will make you happy. That is all. Have a nice day.